In April 2020, two great intellectuals wrote about the COVID-19 pandemic as a crucial moment in history. Indian writer Arundhati Roy described the pandemic as portals, getaway between one world and the next. Very similarly, Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari gave an interview on NPR saying that very important decisions were going to be taken in the next month. He called it a short window of opportunity when history is moving into fast forward. Governments are willing to experiment, to try ideas which previously would have sounded crazy. And once this is over, the order will solidify again. So where are we now? The global economy contracted by approximately 3.5% in 2020, the largest single year drop since World War II. But many are expecting and hoping for a new boom once the vaccine will be more available. In the US, surveys by Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal and Goldman Sachs are expecting a 5.5 to 8% growth. But spring back from a recession is one thing. Achieving prosperity in the longer run is something quite different, especially when we have inequalities, climate change and biodiversity loss as the next crisis knocking at our door. So with our guest today, we will talk about the Global Recovery Observatory that is tracking government's spending on recovery and particularly also green spending. This is really a great episode, so I invite you to watch it because this is exactly the right time. And as Harari said, it's a short window of powerful opportunity for change. And both citizens and companies have an incredible role to play. So let's see how we can turn the tide. Sustainability at Work is a podcast about sustainability in the workplace and in companies. My name is Samara and I've been working with sustainability for almost 10 years. Hello everybody, welcome to Sustainability at Work and welcome Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Samara. It's really nice to be joining you. I'm dialing in from Sydney for once. It's not sunny and it's a little bit rainy outside. So I'm very happy to escape away to the podcast. It's rainy also here, but we are on two different days. (laughs) I'm on Wednesday (laughs) and you are on Thursday. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to be able to talk with you about this topic. I read about it, I think it was on Green Bees or, or uh, a mm. publication like that. And I was very, very excited to see that there is this study in place and somebody is looking at this topic. So without further ado, uh, if you can maybe explain us what is the Global Recovery Observatory and uh, how it came to be? Sure. So. I lead Oxford University's Economic Recovery Project. And in partnership with the United Nations Environment Program, the United Nations Development Program, the International Monetary Fund, GIZ, and the PAGE Group of UN Nations, we've developed the Global Recovery Observatory. Now, the purpose of this observatory is basically to track and assess COVID-19 government spending. And let me break that down for you. We're looking at the top 50 economies in the world, but we are expanding too. And for each of those economies, we're recording exactly what governments are spending on, policy line by policy line, and then assessing the environmental, social, and in many cases, economic characteristics of that spending. What we're trying to do is, as I say, bring transparency to government spending measures and in that way enable governments to learn from each other and the public to hold their governments accountable. And I heard a lot about your study and I heard some interviews that you gave. I think it's interesting to understand if you can expand a little bit more about the difference between rescue and stimulus because... Right. Yeah, right. So this is a a vital distinction. The observatory project itself tracks spending across of of all types during the COVID crisis and following the COVID crisis. But a recent report that we released with the United Nations Environment Program 
very intentionally goes into detail on what we call recovery type spending. So let's take a step back. When a government spends in reaction to an economic crisis, there are two types of spending that they might use. The first is rescue type, short term oriented spending. And the second is recovery type, long term oriented spending. The rescue type measures, that's about saving um, lives, livelihoods and businesses. Here we think maybe furlough schemes, unemployment insurance, spending on a COVID vaccine, general business liquidity bailouts. That's the rescue type emergency needed right now to keep people and businesses alive. The recovery type spending is where governments have a little bit more discretion. This is when they're trying to actually reinvigorate their economy following the contractionary period that comes as a result of the crisis. And in that period, as I say, they have a lot more discretion. In trying to reinvigorate the economy, they could look to new road projects that create jobs, that create some type of GDP impact. They could look to you know, new mining initiatives or dirty energy initiatives. They could also look to a whole lot of the alternative future-oriented industries, artificial intelligence investment, investment in a whole lot of these new clean industries. And as a result of that distinction between rescue and recovery, we think it makes a lot more sense to focus on the recovery part in assessing and in some ways comparing different government actions. So, so that's what we mean when we say recovery spending, and that's the focus of this brand new report with the United Nations Environment Program. And that report, as I say, it covers 2020 spending, and it was released last week, so the 10th of March and is available freely on the United Nations Environment Programs website. Yeah, and there is a, an incredible summary, if I can say that. As a non-expert, I was expecting something super difficult. It was very, very easy to read and very, very uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so congratulations on that. Uh, that is very, very kind to say, as you can imagine. It's kind of crazy sometimes how you can spend so many hours on a long project and then it comes down to these three condensed pages of summary. Yeah. So very encouraging for you to say that. Thank you. Yeah. So before we go into the results, because I'm very curious to, to, to hear from you, I want to understand a little bit better. How did you came to, to this project? Why, what brought you to this project? I know you were working before in another place. Is this a sabbatical or, or how, how did you decide what, what brought you to that? That is a good question, a valid one. Uh, I'm not an academic by background. I was previously working in the private sector and then came to Oxford to do my PhD. I initially began working on a project in the energy finance space. Basically, how do you reduce the perception of risk among renewable energy projects? It's so working away on that. And then COVID came. My supervisor, Professor Cameron Hepburn, who leads the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at the University of Oxford, he sent me an email following our lunch that we'd had and a whole lot of additional conversations that he'd had, an email saying, hey, there's this opportunity to better understand the potential of green spending post-COVID. We need to push something out in the next few weeks. It's go, go, go. Are you available to help? And of course, I mean, first of all, when your supervisor asks you to do anything, you say, yes, of course, I'm happy to. But more than that, this is something that had such direct and immediate potential to impact the global policy narrative. And so I put down everything that I was doing with Cameron. We brought on uh, Professor Joe Stiglitz, who's a Nobel laureate in economics, as well as Professor Nicholas Stern, who um, led the Royal Economic Society and is a big name in European economics, as well as Dimitri Zengelas. And together in early 2020, we spent time trying to understand the economic characteristics of green fiscal spending. Mm -hmm. What we did was we surveyed over 230 leading economists. We're talking about the leaders of central banks, finance ministers and their staff, as well as leading academics to re really understand how do different possible responses to the COVID crisis perform on 
economic outcomes and on environmental outcomes. What we found was that the environmentally friendly opportunities in many cases, most cases, met and often exceeded the economic characteristics of the traditional and dirty measures. So we published this study in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. It received far more attention than we could have hoped and really uh, catalyzed this multi-year project that we're now on to help governments uh, decide on and develop green recovery spending initiatives. So over the past year, we've had you know, various collaboration opportunities come to fruition with the various UN agencies, which we're so glad to be partnered with, as well as the IMF and others. And um, we're, we're now in the position where we have this very stable base from which we're advising countries all over the world and also developing new initiatives like the Global Recovery Observatory. So that's what led to the broader piece of work, specifically the review of 2020. I mean, it was a question that everyone was asking, you know, governments are, uh, or have been over the past year talking at length about how they're building back better and they're creating societies that are oriented to the future. We wanted to know if that was really true. And we thought that there was a desire from the public to know whether their taxpayer dollars were really going to support those initiatives. And, and that spawned the project and that, that's where we are today. It's, it's amazing. And I, I can guess, I can only guess the, the effort needed to do something like that and the people involved and the institution involved, because I think it's, it's even difficult to understand how governments are spending money normally. I can only imagine in a situation like this. So it really amazed me. Um, yeah, you're so, so, so right. And I, I don't want to interrupt, but really, this is the result of so many hours of effort from such a broad team. You know, we have uh, over the course of the year, we've had almost 20 different undergraduate and master's students at the University of Oxford detailed, uh, involved in detailed tracking of different policies, all the way up to the heads of departments at the various UN agencies who've taken these, this initiative on board as their own and really chaperoned it into the place where it is today. Uh, I, I don't want to preempt what you're about to say, perhaps on the government transparency point. So I, I won't respond to that, but oh, I was going to absolutely. I was going to say a quote that I read. I think it was you talking. Uh, it was saying the world is trying to put out a house fire with a garden hose. Governments are trying to return to the old normal. That doesn't sound good <laughs> for the results of the of the study. What are those? Uh, I love that quote. It was one that I came up with just in the few minutes before the presentation. So I'm glad that it's got uh, useful coverage. And the results of the study basically suggests that government action doesn't quite match government rhetoric. You know, you have nations around the world, as I said, stating and explaining ad lib about how they're going to build back better. But in reality, most of them have just been returning to the old normal. Now, this is important. In responding to the crisis, governments have two options. The first is returning to the status quo of how economies were run before COVID. Status quo where your growth was directly dependent on how much carbon emissions you put into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gas emissions you put into the atmosphere. Obviously, if you want to grow and also meet some of your sustainability targets, that kind of model is just untenable and unsustainable, of course. The alternative is to decouple your emissions from growth. And there are many ways to do that. You can invest in sustainable industries, which we already know are going to control future trade and be the source of future growth for different economies. You can invest into them instead. And in that way, you're both able to grow and able to meet some of the sustainability objectives set internally, but also those of um, Paris and others. So that's the choice that governments have. As I say, unfortunately, many have been in the former camp. We've seen about 82% of spending so far supporting 
a status quo operation and only 18% of this is recovery spending explicitly um, supporting new green initiatives. Now that 82%, a lot of those are fantastic initiatives and policy programs that we need and are valuable and in no way do we want to suggest um, cancelling those. Uh, although there are certainly some dirty ones that absolutely need to be <laughs> completely erased. Um, the, it's more about the opportunity to bring some of these sustainability metrics, goals uh, and developments into that spending. You know, if you're going to be building a new school, you can take um, leads from countries around the world in ensuring that those schools are sustainably powered. Um, if you're going to be investing in a change energy system, please, please, please make sure that the investments heed the pathway of renewables and encourage that as opposed to some of the other uh, energy generation types that are going backwards. So yeah, I move beyond your question, but to answer it in short, governments are not building back better as they should. Yeah, no, but that that was the, the the other question I had for you. So if you can define a little bit better, because I'm very interested always in how we label sustainability, because mm. this is changing every day. It's changing. I did an interview the other day. It's changing in fashion, what we consider sustainable fashion, and it's mm -hmm. changing in every aspect of sustainability. So how do you, do you define green spending? And then also you mentioned some of the, the action that you recommend or the category that you recommend, but you have also mentioned some in the, in the study. If you can go uh, over those, I mean, green energy, transportation, and, and tell us a little bit what is included and what are the recommendations that you give. Yeah, those are great and pertinent questions to the conversation. The question on how do you define green is a lot more complicated, I think, than even uh, some environmental economists would think. There are, of course, both short-term and long-term implications of any spending measure. Pretty much anything in the infrastructure space, including green energy initiatives, is negative for GHG emissions in the short term. That's because the construction phase, the material sourcing of materials, all of those pieces involve, at this point, in most country contexts, emitting carbon um, or other greenhouse gases. In the long term, though, the opportunities associated with some initiatives are net negative in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions. So, for example, if you're going to be investing in offshore wind, you're probably in an advanced economy displacing uh, more emissions intensive coal or gas fired generation. That's a very simplistic view of short term, long term. The paper itself is intentionally simplified. There's a much longer detailed methodology documents, pretty much 100 pages long, which looks at every type of spending. We call it an archetype of spending. Um, used in assessing policies. There are, I think, 150 sub-archetypes. A sub-archetype could be uh, renewable energy. It could be battery investment. It could be cleaning up some of the dirty existing energy investments. It could be even nuclear energy. Those, all of those are sub-archetypes that would sit inside a single major clean energy archetype. Right. And then we have the 40 different archetypes, which would cover the rescue and recovery, clean and traditional and dirty, all of it. For each of those sub archetypes, so we're going down to the 150 of them level, we have been relying on academic literature to assess on a five point scale the cleanness and raw relative dirtiness of each of those sub archetypes. The five point scale is basically, and I'm simplifying here, basically very dirty, kind of dirty, neutral, green, very green. Mm -hmm. When I say very green, I mean it substantially reduces greenhouse gas emissions compared to a situation where that investment wasn't made. And of course the reverse on the dirty side. So 
the overall metrics for understanding greenness are a lot more complicated than perhaps we make clear in the paper released with UNEP itself. But in the interest of transparency, that is all detailed and with you know hundreds of different <laughs> literature citations in that longer methodology document available on our website. You have here some recommendation. I see uh, you talk about green energy and what are the effects of investing in green energy, green transportation. Can you tell us a little bit about these categories that you include? Green building. Right, right. So in the paper, which you're mentioning, Samara, we talk about five key opportunities in the green space. Each of those are trying to meet the broader prosperity narrative of um, crisis reaction, right? So we're, what we're really doing is encouraging governments to think about how to maximize future prosperity in their nations, where prosperity heeds the need for sustainable ecosystems, a sustainable climate, etc. We highlight five key areas which we see to be um, opportunities for governments to simultaneously meet their sustainability objectives and bring a big economic boost to the nation. Yeah, exactly. So the five that we highlight are clean energy, sustainable transport, home or other energy efficiency measures, including retrofits and the like, natural capital solutions, and we can talk about what that means in greater detail, um, but really we're talking about investments that use nature to um, provide opportunities for growth. And the fifth is clean research and development or green research and development, which focuses on some of the more longer term opportunities that require some type of um, seed funding now, let's say. So those are the five key areas that we look at. How do you think the, the, the study is important for companies? How this guide how companies are going to address uh, sustainability. And I, I would say, what do you think are, are the effect of government spending in green, uh, in green uh, solutions and how this affects companies, but also if companies have uh, any power to push governments to go deeper into this um, green spending? Yeah, well, by its nature, our project is focused on public fiscal spending. And, you know, therefore, a lot of the policy initiatives that we're talking about in the paper, etc., are around government response. But of course, government is just one very big company that is, you know, a central actor in economy. They're supported by, and well, should be supported by, um, the actions of the various other companies acting too. Now, it's been really interesting to observe how many companies have been more progressive on sustainability initiatives than their governments. I'm Australian, for example, and it's been, as I say, fascinating to see some of the dirtier um, industrial leaders more progressive on climate than the government itself, who is in theory, protecting those dirty investors. So that's the, the starting point, I think, to say that government, that companies are looking to partner. How can they do that? Well, part of the purpose of government spending in any new initiative is to provide a signal for what the future looks like in that country. If I were a business leader, I'd be very interested in understanding where the future is and allocating my resources in a way that would support that future and also benefit from it. If a government, and again, let's talk about Australia, the Australian government is thinking about um, how hydrogen and green hydrogen might form a part of the future domestic industry. If I were an energy company in Australia, I'd be very seriously thinking about hydrogen and how to integrate hydrogen into my existing network and possibly be a leader in that, right? Because there are business opportunities to profit from it too. 
So government, a business can absolutely support government and they should be working proactively with the different government stakeholders to do that. I think that the other risk to be cognizant of is the older adage that, you know, a government should be in the race but not choosing a specific horse. Many actors will think that governments aren't the best at deciding exactly who is going to be a winner in a space because the government's core competency isn't in the private sector necessarily. If that were your belief as a private company, you would be partnering with government to try to direct them in a way that ensured that resources were properly allocated um, as opposed towards something that you know might sound good but perhaps isn't practical. So various different parts of, of the role of business here and in, in, all in all, it's just important that business is a part of the conversation and supporting it. So what are the reaction to the report? What are you seeing both from governments, companies maybe, people, citizens, how are people Yeah, here? well, I mean, we have been absolutely floored by the reaction to this report and also the previous one that I mentioned from May last year. Over the last year, I've been spending the majority of my time involved in different advisory conversations, preparing materials on how green investment can help a specific economy. Last year, we were assisting many economies through Europe. Uh, this year, we've actually got far more demand from some of the developing countries. And that's where we've been focusing a lot of our attention. So the reaction has been significant and encouraging to see, but there's also a need for governments to, in some ways, feel the pressure, right? Because at the end of the day, many decisions are based, unfortunately, on politics. And political narratives are brought on by what is perceived to be important by the public. So if the public does care about some of these sustainability initiatives, if they want governments to literally at the same time boost their economy and help the environment, they should make that clear. And they can do that in a number of ways. And I think that there are you know, several well-established routes for climate activism, but it doesn't need to be that extreme. It can be simply through discussing these um, opportunities and ideas with friends, colleagues, and if you're up to it, emailing your local parliamentarian. I think sometimes we forget how valuable a letter from a taxpayer can be to their member of parliament, their representative, um, in helping push not necessarily their knowledge. Sometimes it's about, you know, increasing knowledge, but in other times it's just to make it clear that this is something that their constituents care about. Um, and so if, if people are up to it, that's a very easy, straightforward step to take to be a part of the conversation. Can you maybe share some, any action that any country have taken or a country that surprised you on the investment in the results of the study, you weren't expecting it, or it's doing particularly good or has great potential? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge question. So the observatory itself now contains over 4,000 different policy lines and I think 32,000 data points. So the richness is just crazy. And I'd encourage anyone to go onto the Oxford Economic Recovery website, download the data set, look at your country and understand where spending is happening and where it's not. There have been some surprises too. Um, what's coming to mind as you say this is, Firstly, that there have been some really fantastic leading nations out there, you know, devoting almost 60% of their recovery spending to initiatives that also meet sustainability outcomes. Denmark, France, Norway, Finland, Germany, all in that, you know, really impressive group. And what's exciting is that for, none of, for all of those countries, what they've done so far isn't enough. You know, they're almost pushing each other to be the leader in that space. And that's exciting and encouraging to see. There have also been really positive developments from South Korea, the South Korean Green New Deal. They had a similar program during the global financial crisis. I think they learned a lot from that process and they're back again for round two 
covering a very broad range of different green investment areas. And it'll be exciting to see what specific, specific projects that manifests in. On the less positive side, I mean, I, again, as an Australian, have been quite disappointed with the government's response here. We've seen about $2 billion in clean spending, which is relative, you know, you know, compared to a normal year, that's a nice little extra boost. But when you compare it to total spending in Australia, total recovery spending, that's just 2%. And you compare it to, again, Germany, France, that category, where they've spent $50 billion, 25 times as much. Uh, for a country like Australia with a huge renewable energy resource and big potential to be a major player in the space, such small investment is frankly pretty, pretty woeful, disappointing. Other countries also have, I think, missed a couple of opportunities and perhaps have room to respond in a positive way going forward. Um, the UK has spent relatively significantly but I think they've rightly been criticized for some of the gaps in their spending programs. There was a large energy efficiency initiative that they announced last year, um, and then they weren't able to spend the far majority of the funds associated with that. Um, and they're under pressure now to ex extend that funding pool over the next few years. So there are opportunities there. I should also state though, that for many countries, we just haven't seen significant recovery spending. They've been very focused, rightly, they've rightly been focused on rescue, on keeping businesses and people alive. What that also implies is that there's a coming stage of recovery where the potential is really strong. A country that stands out here is Chile, for example. Government has been you know, positioning themselves in a really progressive um, and positive way on some of these climate initiatives with great ideas to take forward. And we're hopeful that in the recovery stage, they put money towards that. So as you can tell by my rambling, <laughs> there are opportunities everywhere um, and you know, also moments for considered reflection on what we've done so far across countries and the next step is for those governments to look to the observatories to understand what's next and for people in those countries to again look to the observatory to understand where their, country, their governments have been falling short and to push them to do better. So what is in the future of this study? What is your next step? <laughs> Are you expanding well, to more countries? Are you focusing on developing countries? What else? Uh, yes, all of those things. <laughs> so we are so generously supported in terms of um, sort of thought partnership and also a little bit financially by the large multilaterals like the United Nations Environment Program, the United Nations Development Program, the IMF, et cetera. And they're helping us understand where it's valuable to take this conversation forward. We are expanding the observatory from the 50 countries to cover 89 by the end of this month. Many of those are in Latin America, some in Africa and Asia too. So really trying to just shift the balance a little bit more to include some of the developing country partners that we have. Um, additionally, the work from here on the advisory side probably focuses a little bit more on developing countries than advanced economies. It's both about creating a narrative that supports green investment, but also, and vitally, bringing attention to the big disparity between spending in developing versus advanced economies. So far, we've seen about $20,800 spent per person in COVID funds in advanced economies. That's a lot, almost $21,000 per person. In some of the least developed countries, let's say the Democratic Republic of the Congo, that figure is about $10. Compare 10, 10 or 11, compare $11 to 20,800. What that does is exacerbate the existing inequalities that exist between these different worlds. And that's, that's a bad thing for global society on whole having such large population groups left behind is a 
you know, it's a, it's a dampener on economic activity, dampener on global trade and the future, you know, actually it means that the world doesn't reach its full potential. So there's a big need for advanced economies and some of the multilateral development banks to come on board with generous long-term oriented finance, concessional finance, grants, special drawing rights, etc. And in that way, we can you know, ensure that a green Africa is a part of a green world. We're not going to get through this one country uh, or we're not going to get through this by just having a set of countries all acting in their own national interest. We need to be acting in the global interest. So last question, what <laughs> fuels you in this battle, which seems <laughs> infinite? Where do you find energy? Yeah. You I get this question. I get this question a lot. And my response is always the same. We are so fortunate for given that we're talking about climate, we're speaking in a space that is moving quickly. You know, the climate crisis has been known and acknowledged for decades. And it's just seemed that progress has moved at such a snail's pace. But when you're talking about COVID response, the action is here and now. Governments are making their decisions tomorrow or maybe yesterday. And so the, the impetus and the urgency is really there to do something. Um, and I'm encouraged by some of the positive actions that we have seen. You know, it's, it's almost $370 billion dollars that we've seen spent on green initiatives now that's nothing compared to the 14.6 trillion that's spent overall but when you're talking specifically when you're comparing to green spending in a normal year it's massive and to think that we've had a role in catalyzing some of that 350 billion i mean it's a it's a very big what i call impact lever you know it's an opportunity to use a few sleepless nights now to really advance the global conversation and ensure that we're setting ourselves up for a trajectory that meets our Paris goals and obligations, or at least I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get there. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was very, very helpful and very interesting. Uh, thank you, Samara. And, and to your, all your listeners, what you're missing out on is the video images of Samara's lovely smiling face. She's one of those people, you know, who's nodding along as you talk. It's so easy to speak to. So thank you, Samara. <laughs> lovely to be with you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability at Work. If you like this episode, please consider rating and sharing it. It will help others to discover it, and the more we are learning about sustainability, the better. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Sustainability at Work is a series created together with Traces and Dreams, a collective platform to tell the story of our times and connect the dots by embracing complexity and a diversity of views and ideas. See you next time.